12 years ago, Richard uh, was a teacher at Goldsmiths, where I was at, and uh, he was a great communicator then. Um, so I think you should make the most of the fact that he's still a good communicator and will take uh, questions from the audience particularly well, I think. So anyway, I'd like to welcome Richard to the AA. Um, Andrew's guaranteed to embarrass anybody. But that's the nice thing about him. Um, <clears throat> I'm incredibly overambitious for this talk. So I've done something which I wouldn't normally do, which is I've made a list of the things that I would like to cover uh, on the principle that when I haven't covered them, we could talk about them afterwards. And the list is... Should be an envelope, shouldn't it? Um, the independent... The, these are all clichés, in my opinion. And I think they kind of haunt this audience, which is a rather mixed tribe. But nonetheless, I think it'll be recognisable to this audience. And uh, it certainly goes beyond these walls. The independent curator, the international artist, the installation the intervention, the alternative space, the building as found object, art as a branch of import-export, the local, the exotic. And this is going to sound unbelievably academic, but I really would love to see if I could cover it. Form, content, subject matter, style, and Patrick Keeler. <laughs> Patrick Keeler got written in afterwards in pencil. And then there's a little arrow and it says, the artist, the architect, the brief. So we'll see if he gets mentioned. Um, so if any of those are kind of burning cliches for you, save them and I'll see if I can travel across them. Oh, my notes. <laughs> Thank you. So, it's fig, not pig. Um, I'm old enough to know what my habits are, which is to say I, I know what I, as it were, usually do. And I suppose one of the things that I do is to put things together that, if not inimical to each other, then things that might, might have a connection, but it's me that kind of boots them into bed. So I don't want to discuss these pieces of work, but they maybe are sort of typical of what I get up to. And they often take place somewhere else, somewhere not known to me. I mean, what I'm trying to make clear quickly is that I'm not somebody... I, I don't know how to go into a studio at nine in the morning, mix up lots of plaster, make a big shape, go home at 5.30, come in again at nine the next day, and sooner or later put this object in a box and send it somewhere. I can't do it. I've never been able to do it. So one of the things that I do do is go somewhere else and... I think the word is busk, which doesn't exist anymore, but th those were the people who used, used to be old people, not young people, who used to play music outside London tube stations. And uh, you'd come out in the morning and they'd make the world a bit better for you, but they're banned, of course. Um, <coughs> so in a way, I go to places and I busk. Not always, but sometimes. So it's important to me the character of specific objects. So that chair, for instance, is Danish. And it needed to be Danish because in the circumstances in which it finds itself, it's functioning almost like a flag. And the Danish flag is red and white. And I happened, without trying very hard, to find Danish breakfast furniture, uh, kitchen furniture, which comes in red and white. Um, I've also seem to have done a lot of things in narrow, high-up spaces. I mean, we might talk later about the psychology of that, but I like confined space. I'm only going to tell you so much about my private life. 
Um, and I like that space that's above. I mean, I still don't really understand what it is in architecture. I mean, in Japan, you know, there's a standard ceiling height that's nearly on my head. And you get very used to it. It's a sort of eight by four culture. But this kind of, you know, this uneconomic but heraldic space that we all desire so much intrigues me. And I like how it feels. And I use it quite often. And occasionally, even quite frequently, I make, I hate words like references, but I'm just about to use it, <coughs> I make references to the agricultural as opposed to the urban, or tilling as opposed to the metropolitan. And I sometimes bang those things together. So this is, oh, what happened there? So this is just a little bit of history of, of activity. I won't dwell on it. So, next step, the art world. Now, I, I don't know enough about the architecture world, but I suspect that it's just as smelly and uh, just as weird and just as full of unhelpful and use, useless myths for the uh, younger practitioner. On the right is a British Council boardroom meeting at which members of the Foreign Office are about to appear at. I'll probably be killed for showing this photograph. You'll find me staked out near the tower. Um, the British Council is a, an organ of cultural propaganda uh, which most artists that could be said to have made it should be very grateful for. And there's a quote of Henry Moore's where he said, I didn't need a gallery, I had the British Council. And if you are interested in those kind of histories, you can check it out. Between 1948 and 1955, Henry Moore was extremely efficiently moved right round the world. Um, he worked harder than the other artists at the time. He was probably politer. I don't know, turned up on time. He, he was professional in some way. And, um, you know, Barbara Hepworth didn't get moved around as much. But, you know, a lot of people here are not British, but you'll recognise your own agencies of cultural propaganda. The Goethe Institute, for instance. The British Council is always extremely embarrassed in public because, in fact, it doesn't have very much dosh. And it does give money to young artists. And if you are a young artist, you should constantly put your hand up for British Council money. You'll never get more than about half, half an airfare to Brussels, which means you're sort of over Ostend and the plane runs out. But they will give it to you. Um, but of course, it is effectively an agency, a cultural agency. And I always think these tables are rather amazing with everything laid out. Now, the one on the left is a catalogue for a Biennale in Sydney about five years ago, which was a sort of self-conscious. You can see it's been in my basement because it's wet in the middle. Um, it was uh, self-consciously produced to be like a telephone book. It feels like a telephone book. And it says, art is easy. And it was a kind of provocation around Duchamp. And it was an interesting show and made by an independent curator called René Bloch, who used to have a gallery in Berlin and also for a while in New York and was a personal friend of Boyce and is, I would say, amazingly well connected but likes the subject because there are lots of people in these worlds who are very well connected but don't like the subject. And I think it's important that you do. Anyway, he made this Biennale in Sydney, which, bear in mind, is another watery place beside the sea. It seems that all Biennales are in watery places beside the sea, except for Sao Paulo. And I went to Istanbul, where he was organizing another one. And what do I find on the table but the Sydney catalogue? 
with all these post-its in it. And I think it's an incredibly revealing example of how a system works. You know, if you're on page 19 and the photograph is halfway decent, you might get checked out and you might be asked to go to Istanbul. I don't want to be too cynical, but I think it is also a truth. So, back to me. Um, I'm sure for very uh, anxious and difficult psychological reasons, I mean, I do like borders and I like things which are inextricable. I like things which, in a way, I suppose, are problematic. Maybe because I think the world is like that anyway. So when I see emblems of it, you know, where Lotte Egaron runs out of tar and Dordogne runs out of tar, and then somebody has to come along and sort of paste the gap. You know, these things are a sort of treat for me. And I think they feel like relationships. I mean, the real ones. Other kinds of embeddedness or not, um, that's, those are the AA steps. And I forget why I had to photograph them. This is about five years ago. I went outside and I thought, you know, how often do the railings throw a shadow parallel with the steps? But they seem to do it more or less when I'm around. Equally, people can't count in petrol stations when I'm around. So there is an underlying subject somewhere in here. And I think that's really that we are mimics. I think that's really all we do. And I once gave a lecture at St. Martin's and I said something slightly provocative. And they knew that I would come back the next week. And the next week, the entire audience was facing the other way. So it would be the equivalent of you all sitting looking that way. And I thought it was a fantastic illustration of, you know, you know you're coming to a talk, so you face the front, you know, and you sit next to someone else who's probably arranged their legs like you and so on. And in a way, I think that's quite comforting because in a very sort of bullshitted individualistic society, I think sometimes it's quite nice to see how desperately orthodox and ordinary we all are. So much so that if I have no interest in the pictures that I take, I don't look at them unless I have to make a talk, but that kind of horror that maybe all you do is just take the same picture. Um, you know, it's like that thing of seeing that photograph of yourself when you're three years old and you realise you still smile like that. You've still got a lopsided <laughs> face. And no amount of posing in front of the mirror is going to change it. So, uh, invitation to go to Istanbul, which I've never been to, or had never been to, but knew was kind of guaranteed to, to sort of press the exotic nerve of the Northern European Brit. And, you know, even before I'd arrived, that on the right, this is the um, end of the Sea of Marmara and the beginning of the Bosphorus. You know, they managed to kind of arrange balloons for me on the beach. And I think, I mean, what is that? And it turns out to be a shooting range. Which I think is one of the most beautiful uses of space I've ever seen. You know, you can go and pay a few lira and pop off a few balloons and sink the odd tanker while you're at it. <laughs> but, you know, by my book, I mean, I'm interested in <coughs> cities which tell you how they work. I'm not very happy in California, for instance, where you have to work incredibly hard to understand why it's like it is, because everything is so hugely put away, and all the kind of grimy truth of it takes place before 6.30 in the morning. So I like places which are reasonably articulate. And you can't go very far in Istanbul without being 
punched on the nose and tripped up. So, you know, day two, do come and have a look at this wonderful alternative space. And all the classic things start going, you know, the, all the standard proprietorial things which I suspect operate for just about everybody in this room. The kind of ooh-ah factor. These are abandoned Marshall Plan 1952 warehouses on the water, on the European side. And if you don't know, Istanbul is partly in what is called Asia and partly in what is called Europe. But since Europe is only a political <coughs> idea, if you look at the map, you can see it's just the sort of bum of Asia, or the nose, whichever way you want to see it. It's an interesting idea because it automatically begins to make one think about where something begins and something ends. I mean, water helps, but there's not so much water between Berlin and Moscow but there are some pretty powerful wiggly lines there. So, off to look at the uh, gorgeous property and, you know, like the next person, I'm swiftly persuaded. And uh, very indifferent slide on the left, but extremely blunt, cast concrete, probably US military standard construction two-storey with a clear story box letting some light in along the top, very big with a balcony a loading, more, more a balcony than a loading bay really, which you can see on the right uh, halfway up incredibly raw and very used I mean used 40 years so kind of powdery paint good smells scummy floors, no graffiti, abandoned, hot winds blowing through, July. What really wonderful. But, you know, the point of telling it like this is also to say an immense sense of fear because I'm thinking, oh shit, I meant to do something here. And of course the truth is that none of us, although we all have ideas, actually none of us have any ideas. So being put into a position where there's that much expectation, for me, always you know, makes me shake. And it seems stylish not to show it. But in truth, I was shaking. Shaking quite a lot more if you go out on these balcony loading bays and you see a row of about 10 Russian ships in a perpetual state of animation loading with onions and Pepsi. And, you know, this ceased in London when I was about six years old. So that visibility, that absolute truth about what trade used to mean, I mean, that would be recognisable to somebody from the 19th century and earlier. And it's pretty much, for most of the Western or developed world, invisible. But this is very, very vigorous and incredibly theatrical. And as I said, people mimic each other. These guys on the right, I'm not romanticising this, they, they, that's all hand-loaded all day, chucking individual little cardboard pallets of Sprite or something. I mean, immaculate ballet, but I've never had to work like that, and I imagine it shortens your life horribly. Um, so, strong, uh, you know, for me, very strong thing to, to witness, because I don't see that anywhere. On the street, <coughs> uh, children seem to behave more or less like children would anywhere. You know, these guys convinced that they're warriors and uh, you don't argue with somebody in a cardboard helmet <laughs> and say, of course you're not. And all sorts of very different ways and means of uh, 
moving around, waiting for a train, digging up the road. And incredibly well looked after. So taken to a foundry which somebody said hadn't been used for 200 years, I forget, but a long time. Can cannonballs just lying, you know, the last cannonballs that had been cast just lying there. And then somebody saying, I think we might use this for the Biennale, you know, further shaking in pants. I mean, how, wh what kind of work are you supposed to do when faced with 200-year-old cast cannonballs lying in amongst quinquifolia? Difficult. Um, or sort of minding your own business, walking up a street and rem being reminded that once when I was little I was told that the reason that the column was invented was because the tree came first. You know, and in Istanbul they actually put their columns up next to the trees. And I am very interested in how the world is made, because it is still made. It doesn't matter how uh, internetish it gets or mediated it gets. It is still made of stuff. And, you know, we'll leave here in an hour and walk on a pavement, and it was put there. So in a city that's that vivid, you know, where all the... the, the um, chairs from the restaurant are given a once-over every five years, or ducting actually being assembled on the street with a hammer as if it was mending a pair of shoes, with incredible, I mean, both of these led to conversations afterwards in sort of broken bits of English and French, and of course, you know, the embarrassment of them saying to me, well, what, you know, of course we make it on the street, you know, it's, it's normal. But you never see that in London, you never see that in the West. And everywhere you look, I mean, I'm not in a position to give you a sort of full-on historical lecture about Istanbul, because, not least, because I'm sure there's somebody here who knows much more than I do, but it's an absolute... Danish sandwich city of, you know, everybody's been there and everybody stomped on everybody else at some time. And Istanbul now is 12 million people sitting on top of the lot of it. But everywhere, fig trees going, fuck this, I'll grow here. And doing it with great energy. The one on the right is in the garden at Topkapi and is growing, I don't say this because there are top-notch horticulturalists in the audience, but I think it's in a cypress, but... Uh, anyway, growing inside another tree. And also, a culture which is absolutely full of rituals, which, as a kind of... You know, I don't... I'm not even a Christian, you know, I'm a, the worst kind of nominal Northern European... I mean, cr heavens knows what that is, you know, my, my moral Christian position. But to be in a culture which is absolutely full of very, very serious rituals which are conducted with great energy, which I have no means of accessing. So what I'm trying to, to paint is a picture of great dauntedness and genuine fear. And pretty much wherever you look, everything just growing with incredible confidence and lots and lots of that kind of cherishedness which you don't get in Northern Europe. You only get it in Southern Europe. You get it in Spain, you get it in Italy, you get it in Greece, which is that, you know, the one plant on the windowsill which is kind of stroked and spoken to and watered and loved and extremely symbolic kind of thing. Those are, um, I can say this, there is a hollyhock with a rather figgish leaf. Am I right? <coughs> can I check there? Phew. Yeah. 
and slowly realizing that everything was really the same. You know, the food is the same as the architecture and the, the fish is the same as the fruit. Um, a very, uh, back to front slide, how irritating on the right. Um, but where things are still, you know, essentially a city that felt as if it, to me, that it was still made of particles. So, um, flying. I think flying is pretty, still pretty strange, even though it's been going on for a hundred years. Um, and I always think that when you look out of an aeroplane, that there's a very odd politics involved. You know, was East Germany actually greyer than West Germany, or was that something you once read in Newsweek? You know, what, wh how, what is cultivation in relation to land, in relation to politics, in relation to big government saying, grow more of this, do that? This is, um, I think, Montreal on the left and somewhere in the States on the right. But it doesn't matter where you are. You, I think it's a very normal kind of reverie. So, off to the airport. Very, very anxious not about flying, just about the expectation that I'm meant to have this good idea. The only people I know who produce a decent ticket for a plane, a decent boarding card, are Turkish Airlines, but a friend of mine said that the initials for Turkish Airlines, which are um, uh, THY, stands for, and this is a Turkish friend saying this, stands for they hate you. Um, <laughs> But it's the only boarding card that you can actually, you know, when you've got a newspaper in your mouth and a bag in your crutch and a passport somewhere, that you can actually read and see where you might sit and what you're meant to do. And it seems to me extraordinary that mostly it's done for people who are meant to be wearing night glasses. So getting on a plane and just thinking about these Russian guys going backwards and forwards into the in and out of the Black Sea with tomatoes and heavens knows what, and worrying. And also remembering standing on the roof of this building, which had this zinc strip over it, over a sort of join, and you can just about see on the, at the sort of water, water edge of the picture on the left, it's a bit crumpled, a bit hopeless. And the one thing I had noticed was that, in fact, on the left-hand picture, that land in the distance is Asia. That this, which you could say was the Asian end of the building, and this, which was the European end of the building, was actually separated by a gap. And some of this stuff had blown off. And you could look up on the inside, and there was a gap about as wide as your eyes between the two parts of the building, which I didn't really understand why it was there. The other thing that was fantastic is all of this is made with aggregate from the beach, and it's so um, uh, eroded that it, it looks like a beach again. It's got shells in it. So you're really high up above the water, but you're kind of walking on a surrogate beach. So it's quite a special place. Anyway, this was one little dream, something that had impressed me. and that you could look down this slot and remembering that the fig, you know, it doesn't much matter where it is, it'll just do its thing. And flying and looking in those pathetic flight magazines and noticing that the former Yugoslavia didn't exist for the international flying business. It had been excised. So somehow I was going to get from Istanbul to London, not only across a crease in the page, but around something that was very, very tormented. And I don't know whether this is a repaired aspect of flight maps at the moment, but you know, for a period of about a year, I noticed it just absented from the world. 
So all of this was sort of buzzing around. And it, what I'm really trying to do is to confess to how slow I am to do something. The other thing that was buzzing around is that I'd been living in Berlin. And I know there's somebody here who's German from Berlin, and I'm going to put both feet in it. But what made Berlin interesting for me was the Turkish community. It wasn't the indigenous German community. But of course, there's enormous anxiety surrounding all of that. And, you know, Europe at the moment is in a very confused state about what it thinks it's going to do about the rest of the world. And if you follow the French press, you know that this is at a particularly anxious moment. So these thoughts about who has a right to be where, about the whole history of people moving around. Celts, for instance, came from Turkey. I mean, that's where the Celts set out from X thousand years ago. All of these thoughts were sort of flipping about in my head. And it occurred to me that maybe one could actually repatriate a fig tree. And I rang up somebody who's a, an authority on such things. And to my amazement, he said, well, when a plant runs out, and for instance, Q has to regenerate it, the term they use is repatriation. They do actually repatriate a plant. So, you know, the way that I operate, I need a few positive signals. So I thought, well, that's one vote, you know, for a scummy little half-thought idea. And then there was a great discussion about whether one should get, the f whether in fact it needed to be repatriated. What was wrong with a perfectly good Turkish fig? But of course, you come back to the thing that everybody here more or less deals with, is that you can't control it. I mean, how are you to explain to somebody on the telephone that the root ball can only be that wide? Um, how are you to know what shape the fig is? You know, how, how is this to be really handled? I don't speak Turkish. And I don't suppose Turkish fig nurseries get too many telephone calls about the size of root balls in order to fit into gaps between buildings. Because this is what I was really thinking, was that I would force the fig into this gap between the two buildings, which is about, I think it's 17 centimetres. Since I haven't gone metric, I'm nervous to say that. But very narrow space. Now, there are artists who, who are kind of obsessed with this sort of procedure and, and kind of write, you know, every work is a kind of series of documentations and everything is saved and it all ends up as a publication. And I evidently not like that. But it was very intriguing to discover what, you know, what kind of controls existed. For instance, you may not import, I mean, get this for nationalistic imagery you may not import any foreign soil into Turkey. Now that asks rather intriguing questions about embassy gardens. Because as you probably know, an embassy garden is Swiss, German, French, Zairean soil, nominally. So incredible difficulties started to arise and also amazing costs. Anyway, we can talk about that afterwards if it's interesting. So men came and cut pieces of root. I, I got a fig from Norfolk. And uh, on the hottest day of 1995, brought it back to London. And then various men in white coats came and cut pieces of root off and inspected pieces of leaf and wrote out phytosanitary certificates. And then it got completely comic. Um, I'm sorry about the phenomenon on the slides. Uh, I think that's um, a sigma polka, actually. Anyway, slot on the right and the horrible truth about what, hap what happens to the alternative space. In the absence of four months, the whole thing sprayed white. Every column joined to the next column with plasterboard and studying, completely wrecked. I mean, remember that not very good slide of the dark warehouse before. Um, sort of 
street type lighting, nominal lighting, which I think is forgivable because it was all they could find to do. But you know, I would say the bish of the century. That's an old-fashioned word for mistake. Uh, and I'm very loyal to René Bloch. You know, I'm not. I, I'm, all I'm really trying to say is that you know, once you start in there with your spray guns and your gallons of white, you know, what kind of alternative is this? And part of the process was that when I <coughs> arrived back, René said, now where is this space you want to use? And I said, that's a very good question because you've walled it off completely. He'd actually got rid of it with plasterboard. So I had spent two days retrieving this space between the two buildings. One of the things I like about shows is what they feel like when they go up. You know, maybe a great art show is actually the packing case. You know, maybe the packing case is the real truth about cultural propaganda. And they sit there in a sort of proprietorial way saying, um, Kobakov is coming tomorrow or whatever. So in amongst the cases, you can occasionally still enjoy, I don't know whether that is architecture, but you know, the leftovers of the American military, those, ooh, those, um, that's incredible. <laughs> those apparently are like that because it's to allow uh, forklifts to move around upstairs, so it's a kind of spreading. And actually, you know, I suggested something about mimesis. You know, maybe Sigma Polka's crates look more like a Sigma Polka than a Sigma Polka. Um, it's nice that it has Rene's name on the end, Copenhagen block. Meanwhile, back in the consulate garden, the fig has arrived, but of course, I hadn't realised that it was the autumn. So when I was there in July, hot, muscular stuff, you know, stick out a leaf, put out a fruit. We're now on sort of November the 3rd and walk around Istanbul and every fig is going, I'm sorry, I'm packing up for the winter. This one as well, which had survived its shock. I mean, I won't go into the details, but, you know, the difficulty of asking... British Airways not to put it in the hold because how, how cold can a fig go? This kind of stuff. And by the time it arrived in the space, it's pretty forlorn. <laughs> and by the time it's put in its tomb, it's really not only ever so little, but really pretty weepy. And if you're a member of sort of vegetable rights, uh, I just tell you that it, you know it has survived and it's doing very well and it's got a new home and all of that. So, in a way, the the, the point of talking about it is just to point out how absurd it is to talk about it because, in fact, the way that it operated in the show was that it was invisible, and that people would say, "I hear there's a pi a fig here that's been." <laughs> repatriated. So in fact the, what, what it did was to sort of operate in a kind of mythic space which is I think eventually between all of us is the only really interesting one. So in a sense it didn't need to be seen, it certainly doesn't need a sort of pompous two hour lecture with phytosanitary certificates and me justifying it. <coughs> and it probably doesn't need that curse of all our worlds is the sort of, you know, nameplate jobby that's pinned up on the wall that tells you, ah yes, this is a certified work of art. And um, some of our students have a show in Cubic Gallery at the moment and apparently some, I mean I don't like these titles, but some fine art students visited it. And because it doesn't have names up, they said they didn't think it was much of a show because they didn't know whose work was whose. This seems to me a really frightening orthodoxy. I mean, it's like saying, you know, I went in with a hot poker in both eyes. You know, I just couldn't look. So, I'm not proud of the label on the wall, but 
I think we know something about the whys and wherefores. So afterwards, of course, the great excitement, and I think the measure of a good piece of work, is if you see the world differently afterwards. So number one, that's for the person who makes it. If you do something and you think, yeah, then with luck, you'll actually, the world will sort of reflect back some of what you felt on you. And even better is if it does it for the audience, which I can't vouch for. But since that moment, I'm rather more tuned up to the history of moving plants around the world, because of course, how did the people move? You know, they moved with the plants. Unfortunately, Prince Charles couldn't be here tonight, but you know, somebody who likes to talk about indigenous species and local materials. Um, all sorts of things to do with taxonomy, you know, the obsession with dividing, organizing, and also the sort of poignancy of its symbolism. This is on the right, is Canary Wharf, a caravan selling hot dogs, and those are, that's a plastic, uh, I don't quite know what to call it, I suppose it's a <coughs> hedera plastica um, in a trellis nailed to the side of this caravan to give it that nice homely feel. And the other great pleasure is just seeing figs everywhere, but everywhere. This is a nice fig because it belongs, it doesn't belong to anyone I know, but I'm standing in the space of somebody who I do know, and this is described as the neighbor's fig. So it sort of presses on this glazed panel and is very vivid but is unobtainable. And in a way, you know, that's like, that's exactly what I would have liked to have done, but of course you, it wouldn't work. <coughs> now you understand the structure I'm talking about. And going back to Istanbul, backwards on the left, and feeling that much more in tune with a place which is so... Uh, so busy being emblematic and so engaged in its water. On the left is a timber yard ready for that fire. Um, I hope they never have one. And on the right is an incredibly elaborate arrangement done by a cousin of Takako Hasegawa um, to keep the uh, fish fresh. And that really slow human recognition that when you want to stop somebody standing in your wet cement in Istanbul, you probably don't mean to, but you imitate the oops, coffee table and chair arrangement. I mean, clearly you don't, I mean, I mentioned mimicry, you don't go to it, refer to it and go back, which is precisely why I said I don't really like the term references. And uh, this is to just remind you that there's a show in Cubic Gallery which you mustn't miss. And it finishes on Sunday night. And it's open from 12 to 6. And it involves 13 second and third year AA students. That's it. Welcome to us uh, if I covered all those subjects. I know I didn't. Is there anyone here who's from Istanbul? No, from Izmir. Yeah, so. From Turkey. Yeah. No. So would you like to criticize me for. Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, I. I good.
But this is your first day in London? No, never. No, sorry, I third, misunderstood. Third time. Third time. Third yeah. time. It's really hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, I'm not. Li I mean, it's a good question. No, no, I because I wonder whether you know anything about earthquake, earthquake region. About earthquake, earthquake. No, I. D I mean, th I think what I've been trying to indicate is that okay. I don't know. I mean, I okay. Think Stiffenings, yes. And that yeah. means for I know, no, uh, that I did know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Or that I found out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it seems wrong for me to, to. One of the things that's difficult for me is to know when you make a talk like this, how much do you. You know, how neat a list do you make and go tick, tick, tick to, to justify an activity? And how much do you leave to you to. I mean, I didn't know you would be here, but no. you see what I mean. No, uh, for example, uh, again, uh, according to me, your driving, uh, your your cars with uh, right uh, uh, in Europe, in our country, uh, uh, our drivers sit, sits down, sit, uh, sits down, and uh, left side yes. of the car, but it's like the rest of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I'm passing yeah. the street, okay, whatever. I know it. Okay. I know then it. this is wrong for me. But um, for a, for being a human being uh, who who ha who lived in Turkey for a while, um, that part that slides um, doesn't take clue for my country. Doesn't. Does or doesn't? Doesn't. No. Well, I, but I'm yes, yes. Uh, yeah. I have, I have uh, that part. I have, uh, I have that. But not most of the parts uh, of Istanbul have that. Now, uh, London is a big country. It's a big city. Also, Istanbul is a too big city. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, not dissimilar. No. Yeah. Except you're doing your expansion now, and we made our mistake a hundred years ago. Yeah, but it's the same, similar story. Yes. But uh, again, mm, I'm, very I'm very happy to see that slides there from my country. But you can, you could put another ones in it. Oh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I try to keep it short. <laughs> No, I mean, I under, I, but I would like to know what, it's very difficult. What I wanted to do was to try and draw some circumstances around something, which I think is a very strange thing. I mean, I don't know what the politics are of Istanbul. I mean, I have a, I have a sense, but I don't know them in a possessed way. So why does Istanbul have an Istanbul Biennale? This is something to do with politics. Is something to do with, you know, why were the artists invited to be in this building? Because the building, surprise, surprise, you can all guess, it's going to be a hotel. Artists are always used, you know, there's a quote by an artist called Barnett Newman who says, you know, where art goes, property follows. <laughs> and I don't know whether there are anyone here from Cubit, but, you know, <laughs> they're wearing it on their sleeve at the moment. So one is implicate, you know, when you involved in something like this, and that's why I'm sure that's why it was painted white. Because there's something going on there that I can smell but didn't know the details. So, I mean, I, 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 would, sus I, I would suggest that the talk is full of holes. I mean, I'm not Turkish. The whole point is, what does it mean to be invited to come into another culture and actually to be, I felt very, I feel very reverential towards it. I live in a part of London which is Turkish Cypriot. But 
you know, prof that's a, this is a common professional situation for probably most of this audience, that they travel and exp they have expectations made upon them to act. And how do you act in those circumstances? I mean, it's a rhetorical question. I Very simple question. Every man is a good show, and, and curated as it is, a lot of other artists are brought in internationally. What were the range? Of, were there other responses of the, of the nature that engaged with <coughs> what might have been going on to bring the show there, or was it largely created? It was probably about two-thirds crated, which is why I showed, if you like, what I do, you know, stuff that does live in crates for a large part of its life. Um, probably two-thirds crated, one-third response. But the Turkish artists, you know, have got very strong things that they want to deal with. So there was, were all sorts of political, you know, pieces of work which were... I think I've got a spare catalogue, so I'll put a catalogue in the library for people who want to take this further. I mean, Turkish artists were dealing with, you know, there are some pretty vivid politics in Turkey. But again, you know, as a visitor, you, you can be sensitive to it, but you can't really enter it. I mean, is it a personal question or of what I think other people do? Oh, I guess one informs the other. Sorry? I guess one informs the other. I mean, the way you approach it is... Well, I mean, if one's to be really crude about it, some people have product, you know, and you can name them. I mean, they're not necessarily, you know, they're not necessarily British artists. I mean, they have very clear, there's no other word for it, but product, and that product moves and I've no doubt that you know there are architects in the audience who could make a similar observation about architecture. I don't know, I mean one of the reasons I wanted to make the talk was because I think the two things might flap against each other quite interestingly. I'm not, ver I'm not very, I mean I suppose I have a point of view but I'm, you know, one of the things I was trying to make clear, I'm not Hans Hacker. I mean it didn't I'm far too disorganised to have photographed every single move that was made because as I tried to explain I didn't even get confident that there was something to be done until I was sort of 30,000 feet over Munich or I don't know where I would have been and I suddenly thought, ha ha, you know, I can wrangle with it. And, uh, you know, I, to be whatever it is, you know, it was very successful. I mean, it really, it did work very well because, and there is a Turkish proverb about, I don't know how, how you say it, but it's something like, it's not a very nice thing to say to somebody. It says, may the fig destroy your vestibule. <laughs> something that, I mean, this was told to me by a Turkish, Turkish several Turkish people. You say, you say, may the fig, may, you know, the fig should destroy your house, or the fig will... It's a proverb, but it's a sort of... And, and can you explain a little bit, because...
the yes Well, <laughs> sorry. Uh, th uh, can I repeat the question and, and you criticise me as I repeat it? <laughs> no, I'm being serious. That you, what you're saying is, did you want me to... Did, did I... Number one, did I understand that the tree is extremely mythical and has this incredibly long history? Yeah. And number two, did I want to use that mythology as a kind of lever in the gap to, because the gap was standing for an idea about where Europe or the West stops and Asia or the East begins. Is that right? Yeah. I mean absolutely. I mean absolutely and totally. But the last thing I want to do is to sort of stand up here and <laughs> say that because I, want, I wanted the tree to do that and I think my understanding from the audience was that the tree did it. You know, it didn't need to be justified. But this is an acad this is a school, so we, you know, talk about things and try and explain them. And it doesn't. I don't mind saying that. But I wanted it to operate in that way. But in a, in another way, what I wanted to indicate was that I think students sometimes are very frightened to kind of go into things with their fingertips with their instincts because you know they they want to have you know the history of the fig and then they study it and they you know then they that makes them a good student and then they kind of do something with that and then out of the bottom comes the work and the work must be good because they studied it so hard and i'm not sure that always you know, it's, it's, I'm not, not making a rule, but I'm not sure that that is always some, a human's best friend. It's not an anti-intellectual suggestion. It's a, I just think we're more sensitive than we, you know, we should act with our sensibility. So I have to say, I didn't receive this until very late on. I did speak to somebody here who was extremely supportive and gave me indications. But that's rather different from... It's a very different way of working. And the reason I want, wanted to mention Patrick Keeler, I don't know who, who of you has, has seen London or Robinson in Space, but for a while Patrick Keeler was my pen pal and we would sort of write to each other. It became slightly absurd. And uh, it was also a sort of phone pal. We would talk on the telephone. And he said to me that the most horrifying moment for him was when he packed up being an architect and went to the Royal College to a department which has now been closed by a friend of Margaret Thatcher's, um, which was a very, very good department called Environmental Media. And he said he, because he'd been trained as an architect, he knew that what you did was you had a brief, which is a little bit like what we're talking about, you had a brief and you studied it and you went through and you solved it and then you made work. And he couldn't believe that there were all these people who had no briefs, sorry, had, <laughs> no, had, who didn't work to briefs because <laughs> artists in some ridiculous way are so piratical or bloody minded or stupid that that's not how they function mostly. That's not to say there isn't a kind of hidden brief in there. And I thought that was, I was very, I was very struck by him saying that because I think it's to do with a, some, it's a kind of educational slippage. And I, th I don't really believe people are sort of 
you know, that these people are sheep and these people are goats. But I think what Patrick experienced was exactly that, you know, suddenly having to become something different. Well, I didn't describe it well because I thought I would labour it. But in fact what it was, is if you imagine a concrete framed building with these columns, it, all it was was that in one place there was a panel, which is exactly what she was saying. It's a, it was a stiffening panel to stop it doing that. And the, the very fact that this panel was there, which was about, I can't, you know, one and a half times the height of this room and maybe as wide as the total room. So a big panel. Uh, that was the only piece that existed that made it feel like two buildings. Didn't appear anywhere else when these two pieces joined. So when you went through the main doors, which were the, the, the doors that the um, stuff in the warehouse would have been carried through, as you walked through, you saw to the side this little gap. And that seemed enough. It didn't seem to need, a, it didn't need, seem to need a kind of arrow. But there was a very nice, I don't know whether any of you know, an Israeli artist called, and I never say it right, and there's someone here who can correct me. Is it Micha or Misha? Well, one of those two, Ullman, who's a fantastic artist who's made a piece in Babelplatz in Berlin, which is an underground room where there's nothing in it except that it's lit. It's a sort of, I mean, that's not to say there's nothing in it, but I almost don't want to tell you what's in it. It's quite formalistic on first viewing, but I highly recommend it. And of course, I'm spoiling it because the way to find it is to not know that it's there because it's just a panel of glass in the ground. And if you can find it by accident, even better. Um, and he was in the exhibition and I'd met him once in Berlin and had a great sort of private admiration for him and he came past and he's very organised, you know, he's a man who has a sort of measure in his pocket and he looked at the gap and he said, my favourite size, 17.5 centimetres. <laughs> <laughs> and that was fantastic, you know, that was like being kissed. You know. But it's just an existing fact of this, of this structure. Are we at one of those natural go to the bar moments? One. No, what I didn't probably tell it very well. What I meant was that the way that these things work is probably how it works with a sort of glamorous client for an, archi you know, for an architect. You know, they take you around and they say, well, you could build here and, you know, there's that peninsula over there. I, I wouldn't mind a lighthouse or, you know. And it was like that. So, you know, I was being taken around by, with some other artists, but being taken around by people from the British Council who are very busy and they're good people, I mean they're not, I'm not suggesting they're bad people, but they're very busy being, you know, they're like, a, they're like representatives of the Department of Trade and Industry. You know, they're there to kind of do something about Englishness and over there you can see the Germans and oh God, there are the French. It's very like that. And we were taken to this place and they said, maybe we'll use this for the um, Biennale as well. And it was this incredible foundry. And it, you know, when you go to those places, you know, which have be, are so vividly involved in conflict, you know, the, can the fresh, you know, they were all, it was as if they were still hot. The cannibals were lying on the ground. <laughs> and then you thought, well, what could you possibly do? What kind of work could you do that could compete with that kind of energy? 
So in a way, I was, you know, the whole point of this talk is about, it's a talk about failure. It's a talk about being confronted by lots of things. And if I've been unpleasantly exoticist, I don't mean to. I, I just, what I was trying to say is that these, all of the things I showed challenge me. You know, there's no culture in England of arranging fig leaves under the fish. I mean, there might have been, but not for the last 200 years. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have sea. That's where the navy came from. That's where the power came from. No, but what I mean is we had an industrial revolution and it just pushed it away. It, we lost all of that. And I realised, you know, that I'm a v I, I romanticise it because I grew up not knowing that it was possible to arrange some fig trees and put the fish on them. That's a typical... I'm sure you could, you know, there were, there were people here from the Ruhr or, you know, from other heavy parts of Northern Europe. They would recognise what I'm saying. Do you understand that the point? I mean, you, you don't have any sea? Do you understand? Well, in a way, poetically, no, we've absolutely got rid of it, you know. We've even got a bloody tunnel, you know. <laughs> I mean, I love the tunnel, but I much prefer the sea, you know. Yeah because um, that's another discussion. <laughs> Very dangerous note to turn. I, the, tunnel is, the tunnel is good. <laughs> Enough? Enough, I think. Before you all disappear, I'd like to remind you next week that uh, David Ward will be talking about his recent work, specifically work inspired for, as Water to Water, about his trip up the uh, Upper Orinoco, and also talking about the exhibition building site, which he has selected for the AA, which opens on Monday. So if anyone wants to come along on Monday to the opening, then please do. In the meantime, thank Richard Wentworth.